Hello, everyone. Uh, today, uh, we have the eighth and the last this year conversation in, in the series of uh, dialogues on translation. And um, it is uh, a great opportunity to, again, say um, thank you to the Russian American Cultural Center, who produced all these eight programs and um, offered the information support and the uh, platform for the recordings. Um, thank you. And of course, thank you to, to all my guests, uh, today's guest and uh, my seven previous guests. Everything is on uh, the RACC YouTube channel and um, uh, we'll, we'll just say a few words probably at the end about it. And today, uh, my guest, Sasha Dugdale, a poet, a translator, editor, and a friend. Sasha, welcome. Thank you so much, Irina. Thank you. I'm so delighted to have this chance just to talk to you, actually. <laughs> me too. Me too. So we decided, Sasha and I, this, uh, we pretty much um, established the area of our topics, um, but we didn't discuss anything, anything in detail, anything in particular. So whatever transpires today will be probably in a total improv and I think it's the best always right so we'll see how this adventure where it will take us I didn't think that we'd have any trouble filling the minutes friendly there's so much to say you mean chatter boxes we are <laughs> okay so so um, we'll start but I'll start with a very plain question which is a traditional question in this series um, about your the beginnings, uh, your beginnings as a translator, as and a, a learner of, of of Russian and of the Russian culture, because as far as I know, at least, you don't have any familial connections with the uh, with the Russian realm. So, how did it happen uh, that you started learning and so exquisitely ma mastered? Uh, uh, Russian and uh, how did you come to translating from the Russian? Well I've got to that point in my life where it's actually quite nice to look back and think about the beginning and actually it was and it, it's actually a really nice story to tell because I started learning when I was very young I had the sense that I desperately wanted to learn Russian I don't know where it came from I can't remember that bit but my father told me that I would never be able to learn it was a very difficult language and of course, that was like a, a, a perfect psychological trick. Um, I immediately went off and he had some old, you know, vinyl records of a, a Russian course, which I put on the record player and started listening to. And I learned some Russian words and got very, very excited. And I it wasn't taught in, in my school, but I kind of persevered. I, I, I did a BBC Russian course that I found, a book that I found anything, any connection with Russia, I would seize on. And I don't know where this kind of obsession came from, but it was truly an obsession. And um, eventually I did some courses with the Anglo-Soviet Friendship Society, which was in itself a kind of historical, um, I don't know, moment. It was like something from a Jean le Carré novel. It was, they were all done in kind of strange drafty buildings in Bayswater or Bloomsbury. And all these odd people would collect together to be taught Russian and then I found in Brighton which is the city um, I live very close to uh, uh, a quite an elderly woman an emigre from Russia she'd actually left Russia in 1917 in the revolution and she agreed to teach me Russian and I used to go to her flat and I would uh, take some biscuits and she would make Russian tea in a glass like Irina's got and we would read Chekhov we just sit at her window and there would be a view over the South Downs, the Sussex Downs, and the city of Brighton. But in her flat, it was Russia. There was a divan, there was a samovar, there was photos of her family and her extended family. And we'd sit and read Three Sisters. And then I went to Russia um, just at the very end of the Soviet period. And then again, I went for a long time and I arrived in the middle of the putsch in uh, 1991, August 1991. And um, I, I think I thought that having arrived in such a momentous time, I could never really leave. So um, that that was 30 years ago. And um, I eventually studied Russian at university and then 
remained, I went back to Russia. Um, and the first translating I did was of poems that I, I loved. I thought I wanted to hear how they might sound in English. So it was very much just for myself. And then um, when I was working in Russia, I worked with a lot of young playwrights as part of a, a playwright development um, uh, centre, I suppose, called Lubimovka. And um, the, the playwrights needed translators to translate their work um, so it could be um, shown to producers from other countries. And so I just as a favour started doing little translations of plays by young playwrights and then um, carried on that playwriting translation work. So that it, it, that's not such a short explanation, but that is the story of how I started learning Russian and translating. No, it's it's never it's never short because <laughs> uh, because of Russian, of course, uh, for those who don't have any uh, uh, family uh, history there, and also uh, the translation is such a um, strange activity. You said I wanted to hear how it sounds, how what I love sounds in English might sound in English rather, right? Um, and of course, and everyone I have spoken to so far had a different explanation why this strange and at the same time very natural thing translating is a very natural um impulse right wanting to translate and at the same time it's certainly a very strange activity um so uh, we'll probably talk a little bit today about that too you um i remember um what you were telling me about uh, when we first met i think it was 2012 or something 13 in new york and you were translating some plays already we and you were talking about your work in moscow during perestroika by the way during the coup i was still in moscow and i left two two months after i left and at the end of august uh october to come to the states we're in we happen to be in the same city mm? yes we're like mirror mirror images just as you left i arrived left and the soviet union immediately collapsed <laughs> you remember after i left uh so and i know that you just right uh now you translated natalia Varashbit's play bad roads which is already being staged at the Royal Court or theatres or and um, played everywhere, or it's just being rehearsed for? Um, well, yeah. Bad Roads is, uh, uh, was, it was written in 2014, 2015, about the, um, the fin first iteration of the war. So in fact, it was, um, it was actually commissioned by the Royal Court originally, and it it was rehearsed and it premiered in 2017 at the Royal Court. So it describes a different phase of the war. Um, and although, you know, it's super relevant now as well. So um, how, I, I for some reason, I thought it was written in 2022, but it was written when the, the at the beginning of the, of the war. Yes, yes. So, um, can you just say a few words about the play itself? Yeah, um, I, I'd be delighted to. Um, Bad Roads is, I think it's a, a really classic work. It's um, a series of interlinking episodes from um, war-torn Ukraine. Um, and they, there's a sort of figure of a kind of narrator that flits through them, but actually, and they're very cleverly fit, fitted together. But what they really stress is a sort of woman's experience of war. Um, and how it affects sort of an emotional um, and psychological um, balance in people, in the population, in people fighting. So it's a really subtle play. It's also, despite the really horrific subject matter, incredibly sly and funny. I mean, really the last scene is actually kind of laugh out loud funny, which is not what you'd expect, but it's it's got this incredible vitality, which is, um, which is really wonderful. I, I love translating Natalia's work. She had a, an earlier play written in 2010 called Grain Store, which was about the uh, um, the famine, Holodomor. And in that play, she has a village and peasants. 
all um, going from being extremely rich and well fed to being very, very poor and starving. But again, she does this with such lightness of touch. It's exquisitely, it's very, very sad, but it's also exquisitely funny and lively and somehow operatic and joyful. So she's somebody who writes about these really uh, kind of awful and momentous things, but with such lightness of touch and beauty um, that it's a real pleasure to to translate. I think she was, what, could it be that she was there at that meeting where um, in that gathering and you were saying something from state? I think she was there too. And I think it was about that first play that you were talking, the two of you. Could it be? That's right. We came to Brighton Beach. Um, um, Natalia. It was Manhattan, I think. Well, we were staying in Brighton Beach <laughs> because um, we were, there were three playwrights, Pavel Prushko from Belarus, mm -hmm. uh, Mikhail Doninkov from, um, from Moscow, and Natalia Varashbit from Kiev. And um, the idea was that they would all stay in Brighton Beach and, 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 and research, really, the people there and the lives they'd had and the kind of migration that they've, they'd gone through and that they would write plays. And all three playwrights wrote plays which were staged, I think, as um, produced readings at the Public Theatre in New York. They were they were great. They were again funny, lively, um, just them. deeply entertaining. Yeah, I, I, now I remember all four of you on stage just coming back to me as as you're saying it. Um, when um, the during the first um, about the war, during the first uh, conversation that I had with Mita Manian, whom you I, I, I'm sure you you know or know of, right? Yes. Because he also translated Masha's work, Masha Stepanova's work. Yes, yes. Um, he was my first guest, in the inaugural guest in this year series, and um, we somehow touched upon the idea of uh, the unspeakable uh, because we he was translating a lot of uh, wartime poetry of two thousand twenty twenty two, and. Um, after it was recorded and aired, uh, a friend of mine who is an expert on Basque culture, on the Basque culture, said, you know, you were talking about an unspeakability. There is an interesting parallel in the Basque culture. There is this oral tradition. You probably know about it. I hadn't known much about it, just a little bit. Um, uh, Bertzalaritza. Bertzalaritza, it's this oral tradition of improvised exchange of wine liners, rhymed, metered, very, very structured uh, formally. And um, there was this um, famous uh, Bersalariak, they call him, uh, Zepai, who at the end of the civil war in Spain, um, had this competition, it's always in the, in the form of a competition in, the, in a way, rather than a performance with another uh, Bersalariak. And there was this exchange about Franco, so this, this first guy goes, uh, Francisco Franco is the man of the hour now. And, uh, and Zepai said, yes, for now, he, he gives orders. And then this third line goes, I'm wanting to say, but I can't. And in the Romance languages, it's, um, as I was told, this is it, from Basque. It, it, it's translated also as the meaning. I cannot say the meaning, literally. And, and it went on. So this is, of course, this unspeakable is slightly, it, it's multi-layered. It has this layer that has to do with repression and pers and censorship and so forth. But it, it's, there is also something about the unspeakability. So how do you, uh, do you translate anything uh, now? Because Mita Manin and a few, um, Yulia Nemirovska and a few, uh, friends collect this huge anthology that is now coming out in England, by the way, Disbelief. And we had a hard time selecting from this huge body of work written right this year during the war. People were constantly writing poetry, meaning lines, you know, vertically uh, poetry. And um, to me, it's a very hard concept because I'm completely mute in such in, in such times. Uh, but some people has have different reactions. Do you 
trans are you translating anything that is written today and well how do you find it oh. well i started translating straight away um i just dropped everything i had been writing and i started translating uh ukrainian poetry and uh anti-war russian work um and i did that for a for a few months non-stop i mean i did nothing else and I was lucky because at the time I had a residency, um, so I could just devote my days to to translating quite sort of, you know, it felt like sort of slightly sticking plaster translations. You just needed to get words out there and communicate them. Um, so I did lots of stuff for the radio and for, for newspapers and magazines and um placed a lot of poetry in, in different um, British journals. So I did just that for a long time. And um, it it was a really difficult period, actually, because um, I'm and I, and I know I'm talking to, um, to 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 people who will completely understand, of course, it's sort of uh, was a, a very, very hard time psychologically. And so the need to kind of jump to and do something to somehow occupy yourself doing something helpful was very uh, important and it, i think um in about sort of august september i was very very i got very very ill really and i just couldn't do any more and i just had to stop i had took a break from everything um and i'm starting again but um but i have been uh, but i think everybody is in the same boat i don't even like to sort of talk about sort of because I can tell that everyone else is doing exactly the same thing and um, trying to 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 communicate work and to get things across and to help and to help in practical ways as well. I mean that 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 takes up a lot of time, you know, trying to help in small practical ways. So I and and also to communicate with people. I I realise that actually part of my one of the things I have to do is write to people and keep in touch with people and 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 just to send sort of human greetings to people and get human greetings back again so and it, it it sounds ridiculous but that seemed to be vitally important um so i don't know um i don't i suspect that hasn't really answered your question irina no you have because everyone um so it's it's a little bit uh, like a um i'm sure there is an english uh uh in english like real english um uh, term for that the Postal dove, the dove. What do? How do you say it in English? Um, the dove, you know, that brings mail. Uh yes. Um, the uh, well, it's a pigeon in English. Pigeon post. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, it started snowing here. It yeah. is here too. Yeah. <laughs> Just started as soon as you appeared. Started snowing, and the um, and. Uh, I heard uh, the um, Blue Jays. Uh... Wow. <laughs> Very well. You're deep in the woods, aren't you, there? Is that oh, right? I know I'm very much in the, deep in the suburbia, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> At right. this point, that's good. <laughs> oh, just a forest of another kind. But um, So um, uh, I'd like to us to talk, of course, about um, Pamiti Pamiti. Um, there, is, of course, quite a few questions I have, but I, I'd rather have you talk about what you want to talk about. Um, the, um, but when I'm thinking about translating a book like Marie Stepanova's Pamiti Pamiti, in memory of memory, um, I, I think um, just one step back, um, there was this philosopher, Alexei Grigorievich Chernikov, you might have heard of him. He he died about 10, 12 years ago, uh, very young in St. Petersburg. Uh, a philosopher and mathematician. I'm very fond of his uh, work, the ones that I can uh, digest, <laughs> being uh, not very uh, uh, educated in, in this realm. So um, he said once a thing that I... Uh, that, that really struck me as very universal and very applicable to what we do. He said, a philosopher is someone 
who can, I'm just translating now, just literally. So it, it's going to be awkward. Um, someone who, who needs to feel the other's worry. The other's, not anxiety, and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the other's worry and appropriate it. So this is, of course, the worry of a thought, first of all, in, in this case, to think another person's thought. And it struck me, I think it's it's an it's it's such a universal statement and so true. A translator and a reader, first of all, the reader and, and the translator is first of all the reading, right? The reader, that's that's what translators are, they're readers in the first place. Very with readers with intention. Uh so uh, you, you need to 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 feel the other appropriate the other person's worry the other person's mental worry and images, appropriate the images and the sound. Uh, what was, what what drew you the most? Because Pamiti Pamiti is such a multi-layered and texturally multifaceted book. So which parts, which voices, which thoughts, which ideas were the ones that you thought and appropriated? as you translated, or be, when we you were preparing to translate? Well, that's a really interesting question. And it, it's, it's interesting because with poetry, and I think I was thinking about this for uh, another piece that I was writing about translating poetry, um, about perhaps something like the romantic moment of epiphany, you know, in a poem, um, how as a translator, you would not have felt that moment, but you would still have to recreate it in the translation. And so sort of ideas of authenticity in translation are often, uh, they're often the ones that I struggle with most, perhaps not so much in practice, but more when I look back at work and think about translating, how I translated it. In Memory of Memory, I began translating because uh, Maria Stepanova is a friend and I'd been translating her poetry for 10 years. And she asked me if I would take it on. And I have to say, my heart quailed a bit because I'm very much uh, a sprint translator. I do poetry and plays and voice. And this was, you know, a marathon to the moon and back. And I I was quite kind of, I knew I had to say yes, because um, I, I would do it because it was an act of love. But I was also thinking, oh, my goodness. At the same time, I also knew that it was a journey that would take me somewhere that I'd never been before and I would come back changed. So I did have that in my head as well. And I um I I do I am quite a believer in serendipity as you know, rather than planning. So the idea of taking on something that would take me to some, you know, unknown and trackless expanse was also good. And then I started um translating it. Um I um I think that the thing that really caught me straight away was the tone of the book because it's a very generous um a very generous and open tone and it it's not in the least ever self-pitying although it talks about some really severe and awful traumas um but it's it's always quite robust. It's quite self-effacing. It's quite an unassuming voice, despite being one that kind of ranges over large, um, large ideas and large spaces and large kind of geographies. And if so, there was that element, the sort of sense of a a really quite unique voice that that I I loved kind of spending time with and being with, and and kind of chatting with. So there was was certainly that. And then the kind of mode of the book, the sort of poetry melded with philosophy and the arts was really um, very pleasing to me. And um, I, in, a, in a sort of meditative way, I spent a lot of time with the book um, translating a little bit. I, ha I had to do a lot of rabbit holes when I translated this book because... Um, Maria is such a kind of intense and avid reader and she has allusions to books on, on almost every page so I had a pile of about 100 other books that I had to read in order to translate the book so there was a lot of kind of meandering rabbit holing going on and that was very much 
something that I liked. It took a very long time to translate the book. So I did feel like, as if I'd kind of inhabited it in a way um, by the end. But I was also really worried about translating it. I'd never done a, I have done prose, but I'd never done anything as sustained as that. And I sent it off and I fully expected the editors to write back and say they didn't like the translation. And I'd kind of steeled myself and it's funny to say this now because, you know, a few years have passed, but I steeled myself and I thought, I think I can scrape together the money to pay back the advance if that happens. Because and I, I genuinely kind of gone into my bank account and looked and thought, right, I could probably give back the advance. You know, I could probably and, you know, that and it would be fine. And I I'd sort of really armed myself against them not liking it. And a few months passed. It took a while for them to read it and digest it. And they wrote back very kind of laconically and said, yeah, that's fine. Uh, yeah, thanks. We'll send some edits soon. And it was so, it, it, I'd kind of by then, I was so worried about it that just getting this message was extraordinary. It was such a huge relief. So it was a bit of a epic, really. Yeah, it's, it's funny that you thought that it, you you could not be on um, that someone might not liked it. Um, why? Oh yeah, yeah, completely. I was completely armed for uh, for it not to you know for them not to like it for it you're such a sensitive and always very attuned as as you know from what i know of your translating work and your and your own poetry by the way because that's where we look first thank you <laughs> uh, but so you said the tone which is extremely extremely important to me to me tone is everything but Starak said the tone is everything mm -hmm. right remember when, and he said that, by the way, about translation. I don't remember which one, but about tra translation as the uh, as the activity. Um, uh, but there is also the optical system. Marsha's. Uh, I will slip. <laughs> into mm -hmm. um, she, she writes. Uh, she, she she writes somewhere about the two optical systems um, of seeing uh, time. Uh, and, and the attitude to the present moment from Mnlishtam and Tsvitaeva when she says that, uh, when she describes the uh, Tsvitaeva's reaction at Vietnam to Shum uh, Bremini. So there are two completely opposite vectors of the attitude from two people that are so close to each other in so many ways in the moment. Uh, by the way, I don't understand why Shum um, Bremini is translated as noise, the noise of time. To me, it's 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 a strange translation. The only translation of the title that I saw, that I've how, seen. How would you translate it? To me, noise is is, is not that noise. I would say um, uh, sound, like sound and fury. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This kind of thing, uh, or shellist list three, like rustling. Yeah, of yeah, yeah. Because Shrum has got lots of shellist in it, hasn't it? And and noise has none. That's what I hear. Noise to me, it's something more like you know when you're driving somewhere in Midwest and there is nothing on the radio but the AM and the static. That's mm. noise. or uh, Facebook ex exchanges these you know these days. Uh, mm. Just you know, shumim brachis shumim. So this kind of noise. Uh, it's more like static that doesn't. But I, I think that Mandelstam was referring to something else. It's like sex in the city, you know. It's in yeah. Russian. It's invariably translated sex by Shom Gordy. I don't understand that. It should be translated sex in New York. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it's not a Bashoi Gord, is it? <laughs> uh, so. In um, speaking of uh, the yeah, optical systems, right? So which which optics is because in in this book, Pamiti Pamiti, there are different optics. It the camera, so to speak, changes the position. So was there any most pleasurable and most closest to you? Because you said that you inhabited the book. The book. It's interesting because Chernikov is saying about he's he's talking about appropriating so, so to just kind of swallowing yeah. something right you are talking about humbly inhabiting the text which is very interesting it's it's a, it's it's a very telling um statement i i really um 
I love the way the camera moves about. And it does, I mean, because you're quite right in that scene with Mandelstam Tsvetaeva, Mandelstam is, is looking forward. He's, he sees, you know, that the forward motion is incredibly as something really vital. Whereas for, for Tsvetaeva, it's just a, a sort of disaster. And which was interesting for me because I've never thought of Tsvetaeva in the sort of nexus of time. But when, when I read that, I suddenly thought, oh, Tsvetaeva is kind of looking backwards, which is not really true in other ways, but certainly is in that moment. But of course, could it be said that she was seeing far more clearly? And I think Marsha at the end of that passage just says, you know, that they both ended up suffering so terribly that there was no, you know, both directions, both vectors were impossible. And I, one of the things I think it made me do was, and I've done that this year a lot as well. So it's been a passage of time for me when I've done, is, is kind of recalibrating how I think about history and what is, uh, and what has happened. Um, and, and it's incredibly exhausting actually to throw up every sort of, um, uh, conventional point of view and to recalibrate, but I had to do that constantly while I was translating um, uh, um, everything is very slightly slippery because I think that the whole, in some ways, the whole point of the book is that 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 you you can't capture the past and. And yet you have to try at the same time. And so that sort of paradox, I'm so sorry, my dogs are barking now because someone's just come. <laughs> I don't know if you've had any other pets on the series. I have a dog, I have a dog but he's in the other room. Uh, oh, 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 that's a shame. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yes, so the sort of, the changing of the vectors and the way of perceiving history, all of that is, it, it's its kind of disturbing. You talked about sort of troubles and the, the worries that translators have to feel. I felt that very, very much. I felt very sort of stirred up and troubled as I translated. And I felt in a sort of state of constant um, uh, kind of slight anguish almost um, that was partly about capturing it and partly about um, experiencing it at the same time. It being it, yes? Yes. You become it. Uh, and you said that Tsvetaeva and Mandelstam, they ended up pretty much in the same place, place in terms of um, their human uh, sufferings, but the impetuses of, the, of both texts are, are, are opposite. And Mandelstam, as, as we know, didn't care much about the family history and all these, you know, this culture of that your teacher of Russian had, you know, uh, photos on the walls and family albums. He he uh, he he really didn't care much for for that kind of past, right? Uh, and of course, Tsvetaeva had a different approach. And it's interesting how it it all interacted in in this um, conflict in a way. But speaking, speaking of two opposite um, vectors, uh, Pamiti Pamiti is a very uh, symmetric, symmetric title, right? Symmetrical title. Uh, in, in English, because of the prop propositions, it's not as symmetric as here. And in the, in the, on the cover of, I, I certainly have a Russian edition. So we have, it's also like two wings of that. Uh, semi-angelic figure. Um, so it the it points in 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 opposite direction. So there is this speaking of Shumbremini because we already um, mentioned it. So there is Shumbremini, and there is fourth prose, right? Chitvorte prose. There are two opposite vectors, and in this book there are also two opposite vectors, and they one is almost negating another. So it's like as if the author is moving back and forth in terms, or rather turning head this way and that way, uh, reasserting re re the, the past and, and negating the past and the whole notion of a memory as, 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 a, as, a, as a mechanism of remembering the past, because memory has many meanings, of course, um, including the mind and so forth. But uh, 
in terms of these two opposite vectors, which one is closer to you? I'm sorry that I, I took so much time explaining, but it was kind of not easy to explain. Oh, we don't hear you. We don't hear you. Ah, you know that? <laughs> Hence the puzzle look. I thought it was my question. Now I see that that's the audio. There we are. I'm back again. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. I muted myself because the dogs were barking again and then oh. I couldn't unmute myself because there's a mute setting. But I was um, I was just going to say that um, I don't know. And, I, and that was what was so difficult about not difficult, but provoking um, about translating a uh, book that is as wise and as thoughtful as Poimiti Poimiti. Um, um, to, just just by way of a digression, the title, we thought about other titles um, because uh, we went through a range of different titles, but we, we you know, in memory of memory, it made sense to stick with the the Russian, you know, semantic meaning, even if, if the sound of it and the symmetri symmetry, which you, you so brilliantly pointed out, is lost. Um, somehow replacing that felt slightly... Um, just slightly odd, like a sort of euphemism or something. Um, the um, I I think I because uh, Maria so sensitively writes about other people's souls and their their their. I I I I found myself entrapped in that, and I often I spent a lot of time wondering about Mondrstam. Um, my friend uh, Andrew Kahn has written a book about him, where he talks about his incredibly, um, you know, pr very pro-communist um, Soviet uh, articles, and the fact that he was very engaged at points in what was going on in the system that would eventually destroy him. But that the the drive forward to the future was 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 so important to him, and in his poems as well, obviously. But um, and you kind of apply that to now often, don't you? I mean, I'm sure you, you, everyone does the same thing. You kind of, I see that politics is a sort of framing of a philosophical outlook or a temperamental outlook. And um, to some extent, how we think about history or how we think about time passing uh, is a matter of our own personal histories and our own temperaments um, and so I, I spent a lot of time with these thoughts. I mean, I was translating to Tiver as well, or I, I did, after that, I, I translated Mighty Musica, My Mother and Music, which is interesting because it's very similar to Mandelstam's prose in that it looks right back to that period of sort of end of bourgeois, um, end of uh, pre-revolutionary Russia in a very different setting. Um, and it's, it's, it's difficult because I don't think Tsvetaeva in Mighty Musica particularly uh, is talking about a period that she wants to preserve. She's talking about something that also moves forward and a sort of a past that she in some ways want, seems, you know, really wants to escape from and break up and fragment. But um, so I haven't answered your question at all. All I've done is I've... <laughs> no, you have uh, What I meant uh, that was that Mandelstam in Schumgremine as Marsha says, he nails the coffin with the past, right? Yes. Was, yes. And of course, Tsvetaeva's past, as as lost as lost time, it it is right uh, in in Proustian way, right? It's still she, she's she's recalling it and recollecting it, and reappropriating it in a way, maybe for the last time, just to say farewell in a way, as she, as she did. And also, it's interesting that it's 1920s, right? And now it's 2020s. We're back to the um, this fascination with the with the memoirs and past and the family history and uh, all these things, looking back to the turn of the century, to, to turn of 21st century in our case and the 90s, right? Do you feel that? It's kind of a strange coincidence, coincident, non-coincidental, as you point out. <laughs> yeah, not... yeah. 
Oh, yeah, definitely. I, I mean, as, 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 again, I'm sure I'm not alone here. I suspect everybody listening is the same that I spend all my time thinking about the past and kind of trying to readjust what I thought to the present because, um, and the 90s are a, a case in point. I mean, they're very, um, that's when I was in Russia, really, for that decade. And and so I quite often go back and 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 think about it and then you know how it relates or bears on the 2000s and the sort of you know the the new millennium and it, it's it's a it, i can see why you can almost see why you can almost replicate in in your thoughts the kind of mechanisms that make Man, make mandelstam and svetaiva write their their prose but it's interesting because Svetaiva describes a fundamentally very unhappy childhood it seems in Mighty Musica and some of the I mean there are aspects that she's very fond of but it's basically quite a, a traumatic childhood whereas uh Shumvrimini isn't always necessarily quite as traumatic so it's sort of interesting that um that that but she was not, some... I mean the one that was not prone to resentment <laughs> never victimized herself that's 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 what we liked no she was very um yes <laughs> so it's not even the, uh, that we think about the past again um but it's how we think about the past again yes yes because it's not a closed it's never how closed we rethink, how, how we rethink the thinking about the past again yes and that was something that came up when we discussed primacy primacy with English language audiences actually it was really interesting to me because quite often there would be people um asking questions basically uh that that based on the sort of understanding that the the 20th century in Russia was very very traumatic um but it wasn't traumatic in Britain and I I thought that that was fundamentally absolutely flawed because um you know I mean there are obviously different levels of devastation but there are so many people living in Britain today who will have gone through very similar experiences in um, various parts of the world and come to Britain. Or there will be people who grew up in Britain who went through maybe the Blitz or something that's deeply, deeply traumatic or who lived in absolute poverty for, for much of the 20th century. So the idea that, you know, suffering happens in Russia seemed to me to be quite common. And it 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 started to feel like something that I wanted to sort of slightly address because, um it, it was it was such a wrong basis for 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 reading that book, and I hope actually that people who read it realise that themselves. Because one of the the sort of things that you do as a reader when you start reading that book is you start thinking about your own family and um, what you could dig up about them, and and that that opens huge holes in the ground, like massive sinkholes, um, no, and not just in Russia. I think you know. The 20th century was not a good century for many people on living on earth so i'm so glad that you you're saying that because i think it's good it's so good to to um to confront this idea very fake false and very un and not unappetizing these days especially idea of russia's uniqueness um let alone spiritual spiritual uniqueness and all, all this business um and um to make it more to make this whole um conversation more universal of course um so about uh, something you translate a lot um, of poetry and um you translated Svetaeva, you translated Pasternak, you translated Mandelstam and um I, I'm not sure if you know of my book, Kniga Trajini. I don't think you have it, or if so, I don't want to advertise it here. It would not be appropriate. But uh, there is a book that I will just tell you that there is a book of essays uh, that came out a couple of years ago. Uh, no, a year ago, and uh, in Yekaterinburg. Uh, and it's called Kniga Trajini, which, is, um, which has a uh, essay uh, on reading. And there are so-called postcards that it, the whole thing started with that are responses, responses to, to other people's work in a in a in a kind of interactive way. So there are three postcards, so to so-called postcards, to translators, to, to certain work of translation. 
And um, one of them is Arkady Stipil, who translated um, Sonnet 135, uh, Shakespeare. And one is Grigory Dashevsky's uh, Frost oft repeated um, dream, Vazbratnison. And one is Marsha's Steve is Me. And I, 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 read, I wrote a couple of like, actually texts about this uh, book of, of Marsha's because I think it's just, I'm crazy about this book. It's great, isn't it? <laughs> you can't, I can't translate it though. <laughs> uh, but, um, and about Stevie Smith herself, uh, thanks to Marsha. Um, but I later realized that it, it was a coincidence, but in these three, uh, these three, uh, little text, they're tiny, like page and a half or so, um, my, my text, um, my responses. I address the three pa main paradigms of translation. Stipil, I don't know if you, I'll send you his uh, translation, it's superb. He saw those, you cannot recreate Shakespeare in, in Russian, nobody can recreate, recreate, right? But, mm, he recreated so many aspects. He came so close to the tone and to this major play of that uh, playful uh, playful sonnet. Uh, so that's one. So if you have a, 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 a line, this is one closer to one pole, right? Mm -hmm. Re closer to the original voice, how, how it's heard in the original language. Then we have the opposite. When you stray away and you go as far as possible uh, as you can, uh, but sometimes somewhere in the middle. So I think that uh, Grigory Dashevsky is fraught, which is a superb translation. I, I, mm -hmm. I don't know any better uh, translation uh, translation of Frost. At least I haven't seen any. Uh, his his translation is certainly more to the to the freer uh, uh, free represent representing what's in that original poem. And there is a third uh, paradigm, which uh, geomet geometrically, I would, I imagine a, a triangle. Yeah. So my, my thumbs are, are this line that I just talked yeah. about, one pole, another pole, and you construct a perpendicular, and that's the third point. You create an entirely third voice, and that's what I think happened with Stevie Smith. Yeah. She created something which is not Stevie Smith. And it can be, which is not Marsha either, which is amazing. Yeah. It's more amazing than the first, right? Yes. Uh, um, and that's in a very distinct, very recognizable voice of a poet, which is not mysti any mystification. But so um, of these three points, vertices, <laughs> which vertex is, is uh, more interesting to you as a translator? In your own work so hard to say i i don't know the answer to that actually i don't know um I, i'm not avoiding an answer i'm really interested and intrigued by this and this whole matter and i think that um when i try when i translate there's an extra i suppose mm, mm, I like to, f I, d I don't know. I don't know, actually. I, I really don't know. It's so hard. I'm, and I wonder if it's not for the for the reader in the end, the, the sort of feelings you have when you're translating, they're quite akin to a sort of human relationship sometimes, a friendship. Um, I like to translate friends, you know, real friends, living ones, but also dead friends, people I imagine to be my friends. I like that feeling. I like that sense of a kind of republic of letters through poetry translation. Um, and so I like to feel held in that relationship, however it is. And I think that that's probably the, the, the kind of closest I can come to an answer. One of the things that worries me is the question not of influence, because of course, if you translate somebody, um, you use your your voice to translate them, your voice is completely changed by the act of translation. So of course, you, you, it's impossible to talk about, you know, do they influence your work or not? Of course, they absolutely do. 
your your voice has changed by speaking you know in with with them with their poem but the one thing that seems important to me is to acknowledge that in yourself and to f- have some sort of sense of maybe like kind of some sort of internal honesty about it um but i don't really have an answer it's such an intriguing question and the other thing i'd say is all three modes seem deeply appropriate to me i don't as 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 you i don't have a a sort of view based on kind of some sort of aesthetic or or moral hierarchy there uh, they're, they're all perfectly appropriate ways to work um and then there's the other part which is perhaps it's depending it depends on the day the poem how you're feeling what's uppermost in your mind you know what you've been dreaming about all those things what you've been reading as well what you've been reading um so there's all sorts of other factors that 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 play into it I, i'm I saying think- in the same way uh, i i wouldn't probably the the third one the 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 stevie smith one or so to speak the paradigm it intrigues me it, it, and it's it's just um it's exciting it's yes. exciting. It excites me. Yes. but um and i'm not a translator like you i i really translate very little and um, i'm just the outsider i'm just the onlooker <laughs> and um so um yeah, but to me, it it all it depends, right? It depends. Uh, but the reason I asked was also because you you um you have those three variations, very three variations, uh, that are it's it's if you uh, I once came up with this idea of an original as a little cloud that casts shadows on the uh, on the on the, the terrain of different texture and you know on the water and on the terrain, and the terrain has different. Uh, texture and different color so it creates different variations right reincarnations of that little cloud and 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 the, and then i thought and then by the way i read somewhere even i think grigory dashevsky wrote something and i was very disappointed that someone else came off with this brilliant idea <laughs> <laughs> then i thought that well the the cloud actually um uh could uh can disappear Obličkara style of Sinivia, so to speak, right? And but the translations are there. And sometimes it's very even hard to tell the variation on what exactly, which exactly original quote unquote original, because there is no original, right? Mm-hmm. Um whereas the original, um, it's there is just reincarnation and it's it, it this is the thing, you know, the, the way. You know, Hopkins uh, would say that it does what it does, right? It, it is what it does. Mm-hmm. Um, can you share with us? You you wanted to uh, maybe oh, read, read one? Hamlet. Yeah, Hamlet. Yeah, I I yeah I can say that uh, Sasha sent to me a few links. So I need to be uh, allowed to share the screen. Uh, that uh, Ramon, could you please make this multiple thing? Uh, you can yeah. you can um, give permission. Oh, thank you. That's great. I don't know if you can see it. It's just the um, uh, the page from Poetry Foundation of a poem called Michael Bland. I'll read it to you. I'll tell you a little bit about it and then I'll read it because it, <laughs> otherwise it's kind of incomprehensible why I'm reading this poem. The, a few years ago, I tried to translate a poem by Pasternak called Gamlet or Hamlet. And in the poem, uh, Pasternak talks about himself in sort of quite epic t- t- tones. I don't know if you agree, Irina. He sees himself on a stage coming out with a spotlight of kind of history on him. And it's it's a very, very, uh, it, it's quite a heavy poem. I, I mean, I love it. I think it's wonderful. But it, it is quite a sort of grand poem. And um at the end of the poem there's this phrase which is impossible to translate about life is not a field to cross which i think is basically english the english version would be life is not a piece of cake but you can't have that in there so 
I tried to translate Gamliet and I couldn't come to a good resolution of it. But I also was interested in someone else called Michael Bland. Michael Bland was a real shepherd in the Sussex Downs where I live. And they're a particular breed, the shepherds of the 19th and early 20th century. They wandered around on the downs. They wore these really tall hats. They had dogs um, and they lived in little kind of wooden um, carts with roofs that had stoves in them. So they were up on the downs all the time with their flocks. And one of the things that um, was sort of interesting about them is when they were buried uh, at their funeral, they would lay sheep's wool across their chest to indicate to God the reason why they hadn't been in church on a Sunday regularly. Um, Michael Bland is a real shepherd, but he was also a song, a singer songwriter and he never wrote down any of his songs. He just transmitted them orally to a folk song collector. And some of the lines in this poem are lines from some of, uh, are lines from Michael Bland's songs, and some uh, sort of have the shadow of Parsinax Hamlet behind them. And I think I suppose the 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 kind of artistic motivation behind this poem is that, that Michael Bland is a sort of anti Hamlet because he's so careless and his creativity is so natural and so unaware of passing time and history. So this is Michael Bland, I'll read it. And you have the text. There was a hush. Then Michael Bland stepped out onto the stage. Michael Bland with his pipe and his jukebox head. Oh, he's your man. He has a song for all weathers, a pipe and a voice, and he sings and he roams. He sings to the wind and a dog of how the trees are all bare and jacks come home. He's a thin voice, like a spider thread, on days when the sun is late and fine. Live and let live, sings Michael Bland. The wind yields not, but the hills is mine. He's no call for fate passing over. His sheep are all angels. The stars are his lords. He'll play any part the clouds should fancy to humble tunes and hand me down words. The acts are written in briar strands and the Pharisees are leaves in the air. I like the drop pipes, Michael Bland. Sing, follow, hark forward, the innocent hare. He wore to his end a clutch of sheep's wool to show the gods that Michael Bland went alone, alone for most of his years but crossed the hills a singing man. I remember so well, not the Chelsea Hotel, but <laughs> the, 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 um, the downs and the whole walk and the sheep, and I miss them so much, the sheep of the West, <laughs> West Sussex. And I, I tried to, um, when you sent me this poem, I, I didn't know who, uh, Michael Bland was so I, I tried to look him up um, and I found some photographer but certainly not the shepherd um, so oh, he's a, there's a little archive to his singing in a local museum I doubt <laughs> I doubt he's on the uh, the internet yet I couldn't have found it I think it's it's it's, it's marvelous I really like that um, poem and um and the way you deal with Pushkin. I wonder if you ever wanted to translate Kamen Egoist. Uh, I would really love to. I would really love to. I've never been brave enough to to translate much it's Pushkin. Translate it because it's so suggestive and certainly aphoristic, but so suggestive and so universal. It's so, it's just asking to be. Um... Yes, you're quite right. Oh, thank you. You've given me a an idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is just, yeah, it needs to be done. Um, so um, before we just turn to, we only have two, three, a few visitors. Um, I mean, guests. Um, so I don't know if we'll have a lot of questions. Uh, I guess my final question, unless you want to talk about something else. So this is, remember I said that um, translation, of course, I, I need to constantly defend this whole um, notion of translating and uh, come up with uh, with justifications in a way. 
So, and of course, the easiest one is the art of variations. And I'm, as you might remember, uh, fond of jazz and, and, and music in general, which is based on the art of variation. Um, and um, so you take a composer and you take another composer who rewrites it for, for a different instrument, right? And it's just Baroque, classical, any, any period you have splendid ideas, list uh, uh, transcribing old symphonies, Beethoven symphonies for the piano and so forth. And uh, Mozart, Greek, I don't know if you know this sonata, Mozart, it's, it's Mozart, but it's Greek. And it's mm -hmm. for, uh, for four hands. It's just an amazing uh, piece. So, uh, yeah, but that's kind of easy. This is too easy a, a thought to, to think it for too long. So I decided uh, uh, recently, I, I, the, actually a few days ago, I came up with, a, with another one just occurred to me that, you know, and speaking of memory, it's also because I started thinking about this book, A Memory of Memory. Memory was in, in, in during the Renaissance period is mind, right? Memory was more than just rec recollection or mnemonic techniques. It's, it was, or, or the, um, or the, uh, the body of, 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 of uh, something that we retain. Uh, it's rather the mind that we become us. And uh, that's hence poetry that is easy to, by the way, to, to, to remember and make appropriate, make yours your own. And you understand something something more about your true self by getting in this kind of knowledge memory right knowledge of the mind so uh, it was described during the renaissance in terms of light you're illuminated well enlightenment of course but it's another kind of enlightenment maybe closer maybe even to the asian uh, asian uh, aspect of enlightenment right uh, you eliminate it. It's like you're illuminated by some source the original in this case right and some people i thought just absorb it. But some people whose albedo is high, they try, they, they, they really want to give back, to mm -hmm. reflect. Like Lux and Lumen of the two mm -hmm. kinds of uh, light. Uh, and uh, so I thought that maybe this is why some people translate and some people don't really have this uh, impulse to translate because some people, including you and sometimes me have this urge to reflect after receiving, being illuminated, after being lit by some source, to 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 uh, to retranslate it into the world, which you pretty much said at the beginning when you were talking about um, some poetry that you wanted to hear it in English, uh, to uh, to retranslate it back. So would you? Would you agree? And and by the way, you work at the uh, Modern uh, Poetry and Translation Journal as an editing chief, also. Uh, some yeah, some I think some that's some that's some right. There, but then some people do both, and hmm, some people do both. So I'm not because there's a really big translation, you know, a big tradition, and particularly in English language poetry one that I find a little difficult where people who are completely monolingual uh, sort of take poems and translate them. And then it's not that they try and pass them off as their own, but they, the, the sort of glory of the poem seems to attach to, to them. And, and I, I find that slightly difficult because it's, it's someone else's light and, and not, not mine. And that, that's that's really important that's a kind of article of faith with me that it's not my light um in, to use your your metaphor mm -hmm. um so i i i don't I, I think that's that's a, a good way to think about it i'm just um and i probably just should just agree with you but i keep thinking of that that i've just read this that Heraclitus thing about you know never agreeing too casually about the really important things, and <laughs> but it, there is something, and perhaps that is a little bit um, perhaps what's um, no, I won't go there because I'm I'm thinking on 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 the hoof and and 
this is all too interesting and I need to go and digest it a little bit and then um you, you said it quite right I think that if we if we just said yes to to one way of thinking about things or and uh, paradigms we would just go and we'll no, be nowhere to be found because we would just go all the way to, in one direction but we keep uh, fluctuating that's why we're still here right yeah yeah <laughs> We're looking that way and say yes, and then we're looking that way and saying no, and um, we're still here. So, and um, to close our, because I would love to talk more, and we'll probably will, but outside of the frame um, of this um, framework of this series, I wanted to close this uh, whole season with the two, mm. with the two opposite uh, opposite views one is by elizabeth bishop who famously said that translating poetry is like you know this one yeah. the translating poetry is like putting trying to put your feet into gloves right so that's that's <laughs> one and another one which i am really fond of is this short poem by uh, marianne moore uh i may i might i must if you will tell me why the fan, fan the fan, by the way, for the Russian speakers, I, I had to look it up with the first time I read this poem. The fan is Sasha knows, but uh, many, many of us don't. Um, it, it's a kind of a um, wetland, a bog, something like that. Mm. Um, if you will tell me why the fan appears impassable, I then will tell you why I think that I can get across it if I try. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that we'll keep trying. Do you think that she was wearing gloves on her feet as she crossed it? <laughs> I think that both were quite elegant and graceful in their, um, in their gloves, whatever they were wearing them. Um, so um uh, thank you Sasha it was so great to see you again thank you Rina and I just wanted to say how I, it was wonderful to talk to you but also extremely uh it was just illuminating to use your phrase to read your poems in your in your book and they were just beautiful poems and they're in stunning translations um just really really just... Not, yeah, thank you Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you again, um, RACC. Thank you, Regina Hidekel, uh, for, 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 for this whole year of um, these conversations. And thank you, Sasha, for being thank you. this final, you know, the symphony, the, the, the drum beat in the symphony. Uh, thank you. Be well and uh, happy holidays and may the new year be much, much, much better than this year. And thank you for all your lovely messages. I've just seen them all pop up. <laughs> oh yeah, I want to, I want to read them before we close the window because then we'll not see them, right? Oh, thank you, thank you, Maria. Yeah, thank you, Matt, Matthew. <laughs> That's so kind. Thank you. New Year.